First of all, you have to say that uh, that emptiness is a is a very old idea, very very old idea. It's very common in uh, Zen Buddhism in particular, uh, but throughout the uh, the East, uh, the, were, the notion of empty being empty is a very common one. The idea is that it's not about about having an empty life or that you know you you don't have what you need or or you're looking for something. It's about not being so attached to things, of uh, of being allowing life to happen without you, your interference. So then the way you live in an empty manner by not having to be in control of everything, you empty yourself in a way. If you see a a small pony sized dog walking around, that's what okay. I'm doing here is taking care of Violet. Okay. I love dogs, so I'm okay. Yeah. Well, I'm here with uh, Tom Moore. Tom, thanks a lot for joining me once again to talk about your new book, Eloquence of Silence. It's always a pleasure, uh, Brian, to be with you. You understand these unusual things that I'm interested in. <laughs> well, I got to tell you, I, I love this little book. And um, one of the things I find so remarkable about it is, you know, I was reflecting like depth psychologists are usually... Uh, trying to fill us up with so many images and stories. And I think that can lead to its own kind of overwhelm. You know, people think like, I got to learn all of the myths. I got to learn all of the uh, the archetypes and things like that. And um, so I think it's quite rare for a depth psychologist to, to write a book on emptiness and silence. Well, I suppose, uh, but... I think one of the differences is that uh, when I was a young man, I, I lived in a monastery. I, I entered monastic life in the Catholic tradition, and I loved that life. And it was very quiet in many, many different ways. I wouldn't say silent, although we did have our silent retreats and quiet, really silent times, but it was quiet. And um, I love that. And so um, I'm influenced by those years of mine in my writing and in my living. So this this book doesn't seem too unusual to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you do provide us with some stories and images, but they are uh, all centered around this theme of uh, emptiness and, and silence. And so reading the book, um, I found it's just it was quite refreshing actually. And that's, I think, the word that I associate most with quietude and silence and not doing is just a refreshment. Uh, and so it's refreshing to have a depth psychologist write a book on silence, but it's also a refreshment to, to read it and to um, allow these images just to kind of uh, uh, clear the table in some ways. Yes, I've, I've found from other books I've written, uh, some of them in particular, that um, the, the, the spirit of the book gets through to the reader and it has an impact on the reader. And I, I like that. You know, I, I, I sometimes think of myself as a therapist writer. I mean, that when I'm writing, I'm doing a kind of therapy. I always define therapy in a slightly different, broader way than most people would. But um, at any rate, I feel that this book, I hope that this book might create an atmosphere that is actually the topic of the book. Mm -hmm. So an atmosphere of uh, quiet. And emptiness. And emptiness, yeah. Um, what, what was the relationship? I mean, I know you're, you're toying with some different titles for the book, and I was really advocating for nothing matters. I thought that was a great title. It's kind of funny. Um, I think sometimes your sense of humor gets lost in the presentation of your books. Uh, and so why did you end up going with Eloquence of Silence? I didn't decide. I didn't decide that. Uh, when you're working with publishers, uh, 
you know, they you compromise. Uh, that's that's what you do because they have their own ideas. And I know from my past experience with books, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I am a good judge, but I feel that that the publishers in the past were right and I was wrong about some of the titles that I used. Hmm. For example, I wrote a book called um, called The Religion of One's Own. And when I came up with that title, I didn't know that the word religion would turn off millions of people. <laughs> Just having it in the title. And the publisher told me that. He said, people won't buy it because why don't we call it a spirituality of your own? And I said, well, that doesn't get the the gist of it, you know, the whole play on the word and so on. But I think that was a mistake because I remember when I first went out to speak about it, I went to a place where usually I would be speaking to hundreds of people and like 25 people showed up. And I asked the the conveners of the thing, I, I said, why aren't there more people? And they said, because you have religion in your title. Hmm. So I have that experience. It's kind of stung me. And so now when publishers suggest something else, I listen more. And they felt that if I said nothing matters, which is one of the main titles I gave them, um, they said, well, people will think, well, it's just like, who wants to, they don't want to buy a book that says nothing matters. It's like, you know, they take it literally. And uh, so <laughs> I said, okay. But it would stop people in their tracks. Like, what? A book by Tom Moore that says nothing. Like, has he finally given up on us? I know. I know. I like that idea. But my daughter came up with the, she thought the book should be called Empty. But the, um, which I like, just plain empty. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I know the whole tradition of emptiness. And, and most readers won't have a clue about it. So I, I thought that might seem negative to people as well. Mm maybe the the truest book cover for this, this is just a, a blank blank cover you know like a, a void yes yes <laughs> yes i was hoping for something like that or at least maybe a little uh zen like cover that would be. but again the covers you know the publishers know what works for them and uh, so as i say it's a compromise yeah well, I mean, that's very much that attitude uh, is very much in the spirit of the book of emptiness. Yes. Um, it... Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit broadly about emptiness and what, uh, I guess, cultivating an attitude of emptiness can can bring to your life. Well, um, first of all, you have to say that uh, that emptiness is a is a very old idea, very very old idea. It's very common in uh, Zen Buddhism in particular, uh, but throughout the uh, the East, uh, the, were, the notion of empty being empty is a very common one. It's one of the greatest uh, uh, hymns or prayers that people say is the Heart Sutra, which is the word empty is used like maybe fifty times in the in this one one prayer and um and one that i i really love um but um the idea is that it's not about about having an empty life or that you know you you don't have what you need or or you're looking for something it's about not being so attached to things of uh of being allowing life to happen without your interference so then the way you live in an empty manner by not having to be in control of everything, you empty yourself in a way. There's a, there's a Christian idea of emptiness, it's called kenosis, which is about a particular kind of emptying of yourself. That's what it means pretty much. And I think that's part of the emptiness I'm interested in, kenosis. You empty yourself and let life itself uh, guide you. And, and you don't have to be in control of every single thing. And you don't take everything literally. You, you have a big gap between the things you, you talk about and, and what, you have to, what you intend. In other words, you, you, um, you speak more poetically and uh, you don't insist on things and you don't have to believe in everything. I think emptiness is not really about belief so much as as letting life be and let the mysteries be and you don't have to explain everything and understand everything. So that kind of emptiness can be very freeing and liberating. Yeah, like a kind of ambivalence, 
like a, a holy ambivalence or something just to you know it's not like uh yeah um i i remember i was spending time with a an old uh, yoga teacher years ago and he had spent time and been influenced by someone uh who was known as the anti-guru guru uh ug krishnamurti who's uh uh, who's kind of a brother to Jay Krishnamurti, who's the more famous Krishnamurti. Um, and he said that being with UG was like being with a cat. He said, no agenda. There was no agenda there. He was just in his natural state, which meant not that he was in a yogic posture all the time, but he would kick back on the couch and um, you know, friends would come over and talk to him and bring him questions. And he would rather uh, sing songs or or tell jokes um, things like that. But I love that. It was like being with a cat. There was no agenda. Beautiful. Yeah. It's like a cat. It just sits there doing nothing. It's a very good idea. And uh, one of the, uh, this book of mine is 30 stories, or in some cases, little statements from people uh, about emptiness. One of the traditions is, it's an old tradition, that when you want to talk about emptiness, you might use an image of something that is actually empty like there's a story there about an empty pot or there might be a quotation from uh, the Tao Te Ching that talks about how a house needs the emptiness of windows and doors and uh, so what I do is I, I take those concrete images and even though there are traditional ideas about them I use my own imagination as well to see how that emptiness how these stories give us a, another view of what emptiness could be. So there are 30 different facets of emptiness in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder, um, one of the things I was thinking about leading up to this talk was maybe reading a couple of these little stories or poems and then having you just uh, comment on them. What do you think about yes. that? Now, can you read them? Do you have them? Yeah, I've, I've picked out a few of my favorites. I don't have the book. <laughs> it's not out yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got the book. So yeah, book. No, I picked out a few of the ones that um Good. that leaped out at me. Uh so one of the first ones is from uh Shunryu Suzuki, the great Zen teacher. Mm -hmm. And uh you title it Nothing is Natural. True practice of Zazen is to sit as if drinking water when you are thirsty. There you have naturalness. It is quite natural for you to take a nap when you're very sleepy, but to take a nap just because you are lazy, as if it were the privilege of a human being to take a nap, is not naturalness. You think, my friends, all of them are napping. Why shouldn't I? Well, this is not naturalness. Your mind is entangled with some other idea, someone else's idea, and you are not independent, not yourself, and not natural. True being comes out of nothingness, moment after moment. Nothingness is always there, and from it, everything appears. It's great. That's Drink when you're thirsty, right. sleep when you're sleepy. Yeah, and, and don't think about it, and don't have a lot of... See, there's a kind of neurosis, I think, a neurotic way of doing things where you might do something that's really quite good, but you do it because you want people to see you doing it and, and maybe think highly of you. That is a perfect example of not being empty. Uh, you have some intrusive, often it's an egotistical thing that comes in, uh, quite neurotic, that gets in the way of you being natural. So I, I like that uh, quotation from uh, Suzuki, and I wanted to, uh, from the beginning of the writing, the, putting this book together, I wanted to have that uh, that statement of his. Uh, he, in other parts of his book, called well, his book is is. Uh, uh, Zen mind, beginner's mind. And beginner's mind is a kind of emptiness too. It's like you go back to, you're starting over and you don't know anything. Mm -hmm. That's another way of having a beginner's mind and being natural. But I thought that um, that his idea, his image of the frog too, not just the cat, but the frog, uh, the frog for him is an example of being natural. You just sit like a frog and uh, mm -hmm. you don't, you don't really do anything. And, Until it's uh, time to leap or to grab well, a fly. Or... You stick your tongue out or whatever they do. And uh, yeah, to grab a fly. But then it's coming out of, that is coming really out of the emptiness. 
the, the frog is really still all that time and then suddenly it goes into action. So that that is a pretty good example of emptiness. It's not that you, you want all of life to be just sitting around, that's not it, but that you are your actions come out of a still place so that they have a maybe they have some uh, they're not excitable and they're not full of all kinds of machinations in your mind and trying to accomplish a lot of things with what you do. It's just doing. And uh, if you can get close to that naturalness, I think you're under, you're, you're close to emptiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In uh, your reflections on that in the book, you talk about this in the context of uh, a naturalness in the kind of ordinary conversations you might have with friends. Um, and I think that really grounds it, uh, takes it out of the kind of ethereal abstract. Like, how, here's how I can bring emptiness into my conversations. And what you say is, um, like, when you, you ask how you're doing, well, you respond with naturalness. Uh, you talk about how you feel without any regard for, um, you know, how, how they might judge you, right? That's Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, uh, pe people often have conversations where it seems like there are several layers going on. In one layer, you're just talking about some subject, and from the outside, it looks quite simple. But inwardly, there are all kinds of things happening. One, one Maybe one person is trying to win out over the other because they feel competitive. Uh, and that has a lot of roots. So when you get to it, you know, like in therapy, when you find those roots and explore them, you realize that that conversation had no emptiness in it at all. It was so full of, of effort to try to accomplish things. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing you can do. Another, I think, is there's there's a kind of a, there's a way of talking that is straight and that, is, again, is not complex and doesn't have all those layers. So if someone says, how are you? You could say, well, uh, today, I'm feeling pretty good, but uh, I am bothered, worried about what's coming up later in the day, and that's on my mind. You can say exactly what's going on. And I think when you do that, uh, you, you, you've got nothing left over. It's like you, you've done it. You've said it. That's who you are. There's no trickery. It's just as right. as can be. Yeah, like you're not trying to impress or to outdo or to manipulate or uh, you're just you're telling it like it is. Uh, and you talk about what's one of the things you appreciated about your relationship with James Hillman is that whenever you ask them, like, how are things going or how are you doing? You would give it to you quite straight. Yes. Oh, yes. Always. Very frequently, he would say, uh, I'm not feeling very good today. It was rare that he would he, he would say that everything was fine. In fact, I don't think I ever heard him say that. But uh, he he would say um, he would tell you he'd say, "Well, I'm I'm uh, I'm feeling a bit sad, or I'm feeling a bit depressed today, and I'm hoping that it'll be gone by the afternoon." Something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it can be uh, like again. There's that word refreshing, right? And um, then you, you can relax around the other person because there's there's no artifice, there's no front. And like like if if someone offers that back to you, like a really honest and direct response to a question like that, maybe then that allows you to just get real with what's going on for you and go, you know what? I said I was doing fine, but you know, my health is okay, but God, I'm worried about the world. It seems like it's all going to hell. And like, and then maybe you can have a real soul to soul conversation about like what's actually happening in your lives. Right. And the other person knows where you are. Uh, they don't know if you just give a, a pat answer, you know, the usual thing. They don't know really what's going on with you. So that's been, there's been this interaction that really is not very real. What emptiness does, I think, help create a certain, uh, not only naturalness, but a, 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 if there's such a word, realness, you know, kind yeah. of a, a reality between people. This is genuine. This is real what's going on now. And it's not it's not a game being played. Yeah, yeah, I feel that too. I think it, it came out of what I was saying there, um, like keeping it real, you know, like, let's just keep it real, as yeah. the kids might say. Right. That's great. Um, another one I really like. You use uh, stories that feature Nasruddin. Yes. 
a couple times and uh he's this kind of but i don't exactly know what tradition he comes out of it's middle eastern persian maybe uh but he's a kind of trickster figure right he's kind of tricky in ways and some sometimes now he changes in the stories there are a lot of stories about him uh, I think it's basically, uh, he's a Sufi character, as far as I know. He comes out of the Sufi tradition, or they use his, him a lot. They use, mm -hmm. use stories about him. And so often they are teaching stories. And sometimes he's just a simple, uh, pious teacher. And other times he's very wily, and you don't know what he's up to. Yeah, like he plays the fool. Uh, yeah. So there's one that's really great. It's called uh, The Empty Plate. Uh, Nasruddin was having dinner with a group of friends at the home of a wealthy and powerful civic leader. The host was obviously competing for attention and watched Nasruddin closely. The servers brought a platter of large, juicy melons for dessert, and the two prominent men ate theirs with gusto. But then the envious host took his plate of melon rinds, and when Nasruddin wasn't looking, piled them on Nasruddin's plate. You're a glutton, he said to Nasruddin. Look at all the melons you ate. But Nasruddin pointed to his host's empty plate and said, well, at least I didn't eat the rinds. <laughs> right. So there we have, we have. We, we, I mean, is that the end of the teaching? Like, how are these given in the Sufi tradition? Like, do they just, is that where the story ends? Yes. They, uh, yeah. It ends there, but you could, you know, could they can be used for discussion and or maybe a teacher uh, interpreting them in a certain way, the way I would do it in the book. So it's there, I, as far as I know, there are no standard uh, interpretations of these stories, but they are used to um, to teach lessons and to I think more than teach lessons, probably probably be better to say that they are used to upend the usual thinking of the student you know it's like a zen student too you uh, the, the purpose of the teaching is to in a way take away what's comfortable for the student and i think nasr din does that a lot he, he he's 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 a hermes like character mm -hmm. you know he's he, you you can't really fully trust him and you don't really know what he's up to but he makes you think and makes you reconsider everything. Mm -hmm. So uh, talk about the story a little bit. What do you think is the, the point of it? Well, uh, one, one part of it is that uh, there are different aspects of it. One would be that uh, you, have, you have two people or you, you have uh, who are somewhat in competition and, and the, uh, the, the civic leader there, the, the man from the, city uh is really you know he 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 kind of goes too far in trying to uh to make uh Nasruddin look bad so um we, we see that that can happen you know that people like they like he he piled all these uh lemon or these melon rinds on on Nasruddin's uh, plate and then but what happened was then his plate was empty and that's the emptiness in the story. Uh, Nasruddin sees the empty plate and makes use of it. He sees the emptiness there and is able to say, well, look, this, this shows what you're up to. It shows who you are, the empty plate. That's a common image, the empty plate. And what I'd like to say about this in, uh, generally in those stories is that you might very well, any of us might very well be sitting down to eat somewhere in a restaurant, and you might notice an unusual empty plate around that might that might be the thing that, that if you if you know the, the story, you might see that empty plate in the restaurant and see that it has uh, a lot of symbolic potency to it and meaning. Um, like the example I give about emptiness in general is that you might you might have a plan to have dinner with somebody and they don't show up. And there you are sitting mm -hmm. there maybe for a long time, staring at the empty chair across from you. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know these stories, you'll know that that empty chair is saying something to you. That's the presence of emptiness suddenly appearing in your life. And your job could be to 
to read it just the way Nasruddin does in this story. He reads that empty plate uh, and then he's able to come out of it okay, come out of that situation all right. Yeah, well, maybe you, like sitting across from that empty table setting, that empty plate, yeah. instead of uh, you know wondering about you know what it means that your friend's not there, didn't show up, that it reflects badly on you, that oh maybe you know kind of filling yourself up with all these uh, kind of negative ideas or interpretations, you could uh, just empty yourself and, and enjoy the meal and enjoy the kind of time by yourself or time to just really focus on the food. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You could see that the emptiness is there and it has a presence and it's not all negative. You could say, I think, that the emptiness is never without its other levels of meaning for you. So the idea is never to take the emptiness literally, but to always see that it is like a dream situation. It's more something to be taken at a different level, always. Mm. Yeah, something about the, the Nasruddin story, too. I mean, the the civic leader, he obviously feels a little um, challenged by having this important spiritual teacher there. And so he he wants to uh, show he wants like there's one upmanship there and he's kind of like full of himself, but uh, he's kind of performing virtue in a way. And so I think he used the word uh, empty virtue and Nasruddin by kind of turning the table on him and using his empty plate against him uh, kind of points out his uh, like that he's full of himself. He's actually like kind of a pig. Yes, things are often the opposite of what they appear to be. And in this case, well, I think one thing, another aspect of it that's interesting is that the, the, this leader, uh, the city leader, the town leader, whatever he was, um, he, is, he is piling things up on Nasruddin's plate. In other words, he is, he's, he's not really a, a, a representative of emptiness, just the opposite. And I think a lot of uh, people do that to us, like teachers do it. They pile up things on us. They, 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 they ask us to remember so many things. They ask us to read so much and uh, all that kind of thing. There's a little emptiness in education. I think there could be more emptiness. That's why it always really discourages me or it makes me feel bad when I hear that um, some people are suggesting that children have less recess in a day at school. I think mm. if it were me, I'd have mostly recess and the, the rest of maybe a little <laughs> bit of time for study. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, let's, take a, let's take a break in the play and come in and uh, talk a little bit about history. Uh, hmm. I heard on a, a radio show the other day that uh, some schools have whittled down recess to seven minutes oh, uh, my because they found any more than that and kids might not be able to kind of self-regulate and there'll be more conflict, uh, just kind of showing where kids' um, mental health is these days that they can only tolerate being together and play, uh, unstructured play for seven minutes. Oof, that's disturbing. It is disturbing. Yeah. Um, I know what that is, a if I can say it, I know as a teacher that uh, I, uh, you know that I'm, I'm teaching a, an online course where I have readings and people who tell, talk to me before deciding whether to take the course, tell me how many hours do they have to read? <laughs> and I tell them yeah. maybe 20 minutes. <laughs> and, <laughs> they go, where's the value? I want to be crammed full of stuff. I want more bang right. for my buck. That's it. The more, that's the opposite of emptiness. I, I want more. You know, I want some sign that I'm getting something. And if, as long as there's more of it, it's a good sign, you know, the way the world works. And I'm doing just the opposite. Yeah, you're kind of like Nasruddin. You're subverting that um, the kind of capitalist paradigm that uh, you know more stuff, more information, more hours, more readings equals more value, uh, which just isn't the case. It's just no. more stuff. <laughs> and you know, again, as a teacher, a lot of times I, I'm really happy, and I those moments when people ask me questions and I can say, I don't know. Or I'll, I'll, I'll say to people, I did it this week with some people in the, in the course. I, I said, uh, oh, I never thought of that, you know, when they wrote something. 
I've never considered that before. Really interesting. But I'm not supposed to be the one who doesn't know. You know, I'm supposed to be the one who knows as a teacher. So I like bringing that kind of emptiness. There's another story. I don't know if it's in the book, actually. I don't remember. But one time I was lecturing in Syracuse, New York, uh, at an interfaith uh, uh, conference. And there were, I think, maybe like, if I remember, 200, 250 people there, all mostly ministers and priests and nuns. And, and there was a Zen teacher, a woman sitting right in the first row with her Zen uh, garments on. And I was talking about the soul and spirit, the living uh, a soulful spirituality. And as I talked, I could see this woman there in front of me, and I kept thinking to myself, a Buddhist, a Zen Buddhist doesn't want to use the word soul. Mm -hmm. So at the break, I went up to her and I said, uh, I said, you know, I'm using this word soul, but you know, it's not, it's not necessary. You know, that word is not the important thing. And she bowed to me and she said, I know it's empty. And I thought that's a good use of emptiness. And of course, the Zen Buddhist, the, the teacher would know, I think, if they're educated in the Buddhism, we know that emptiness is part of life and you, you try to incorporate it always. Hmm. Yeah, I thought you were going to uh, bring up this story that you've got in there. Uh, it's a little excerpt from Henry David Thoreau uh, about not knowing. Uh, and you title it, Knowing Not Knowing. Uh, maybe I'll read that. It is only when we forget all our learning that we begin to know. I do not get nearer by a hair, hair's breadth to any natural object so long as I presume that I have an introduction to it from some learned man. To conceive of it with a total apprehension, I must for the thou thousandth time approach it as something totally strange. Um, this reminds me of uh, some of the exercises that Rudolf Steiner would give his students. Um, trying to remove all the preconceptions about the tree or the flower and just be with the tree, be with the flower and uh, let it speak to you in a way. Like, this is like you know, my, the way my yoga teacher talked about it. It's like one of the second or third stages of actual meditation where the object, because you've emptied your mind, the object starts to reveal itself to you. And there's this uh, interchange between your openness and the object uh, showing itself in its um, natural state or, or true true state. And there's uh, Thoreau, one of your favorite transcendentalists, New Englanders, yeah? yeah? Yes, that's right. And Thoreau was, was consistent with that kind of a thought. He, he, he says it over and over again in different ways. Uh, and I think what he is, uh, that he was not an anti he was not anti intellectual at all he was very uh, a very learned person he read a great deal and, and he was very good at languages and he graduated from harvard university I mean, you know it's pretty good he was quite uh, quite uh, cerebral in many ways and yet he spent his time out in nature most of his time in nature and so it was very important to him not to be in, not to say that ideas are not valuable because he was it was just the opposite for him but to be able to go into the world without having to have that screen of of ideas in between you and the objects of the world he you know he would want to uh he would want you to be learned and to, i just read him yesterday where he was saying how he thought every village should be a university that teaches its citizens everything, you know, at a very high level of thought. Hmm. He was very interested in that. But then I guess, you know, the way I, what the impression I get is that he thought that if you were smart enough, if you really did learn good ideas, you would know to go into the world and let things be, let them be right there in front of you without all the, all the ideas and all the preconceptions you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, you include a, a really nice translation of uh, one of the passages from the Tao Te Ching in there. Um, and it's got the great play on words because it, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around a concept like not knowing. Um, and so I think it, it's from, uh, you said, the poet David Hinton. And uh, it's the passage 71 of Tao Te Ching. Knowing, not knowing is lofty, 
not knowing not knowing is affliction. And so we have to say, uh, when you read it, it might be a little easier to get because not knowing is given as one thing with a, it's hyphenated. So knowing, not knowing is lofty, not knowing, not knowing is affliction. <laughs> it's like, just let that rattle around in your cage <laughs> for the rest of the day as you walk <laughs> through the forest, you know? Yes. I think it's a very, very good idea, though. Uh, if you, uh, there's a difference between uh, cultivating a, a level of uh, of ignorance or not knowing things so that understanding you don't you don't know anything ultimately or that uh, you don't know as much as you think you do uh, but to know that that this is what you're doing is one thing but if you're just going around not knowing anything then you've got a problem so you really have to know that you're not knowing <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah it's kind of like you need to acquire some knowledge some information and then empty it out in a way yeah. if you're just kind of like ignorant you know there's like ignorance and i think that's why suzuki uses the term beginner's mind there's yeah. like a going back right and it's like the biblical idea of you can only enter the kingdom of god uh, as a child Yes. It's kind of like a an emptying out kenosis, return to innocence. Uh, but you've already kind of done some of that acquisition and uh, carried around big ideas for a while, right? For it to be like authentic or honest or something. Yes, I think so. You're reminding me of another source of not knowing that I like very much is uh, Erasmus, who was a 16th century philosopher and theologian. Um, a Dutch philosopher, and he uh, he wrote a book called In Praise of Foolishness, or we sometimes call it In Praise of Folly. I think we, I think a better way of saying it is In Praise of Foolishness. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very interesting book. It's one of my favorites, really. And he, he wrote it when he was visiting Thomas More of England, which has always appealed to me. I kind of always identify with Thomas More of England. And, and so there is uh, Erasmus in his house deciding to write a book while he's visiting. For, they visited for a long time in those days. Um, and he's writing a book about how valuable foolishness is or not knowing would be part of that. And he describes that. So uh, he would suggest cultivating the fool in you, cultivating that. So if you are shown to be ignorant of things, that you don't know things that maybe people would expect you to know, that that's a good moment. I think psychologically that it's also a very good thing when uh, sometimes uh, our ignorance is revealed. I think a lot of times we try to cover it up yeah. and sometimes it's just revealed. And that's a good moment because it's a kind of uh, sinking into into that part of you that, or that part of living that is so important, but it's difficult to sustain because it seems, it feels inferior or it feels feels bad. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, uh, but at a certain point, you know, maybe it starts to feel more freeing. And I don't know, like for me, what that turning point was, it was like, just like a softening of the ego over time maybe, um, to where I just don't care about um, seeming smart or being better than anyone at anything else. I just try to enjoy what I do. Uh, but I don't know how you cultivate that <clears throat> other than go through life and maybe get knocked down enough times. Yeah, I, just, think, I, think, of... I think that's it. I feel, I, well, I feel it myself. I feel frequently that I should know something that I don't know. It happens all the time. Uh, well, yeah, you carry a lot of projection. You know, you're a, you're a well-known author of uh, these spiritual and soulful books. Right, right. So, yeah. So there's the, the, there are these expectations, and I often uh, fail them. And that sinking feeling, I remember uh, going back to James Selman, he used to say that inferiority is really where the soul is found. You know, you find your soul in your inferiority. If you can find those places where you are not on top of it, where you 
are not perfect and where you can't do what you'd like to do. Those moments are really where you finally open a door to that deeper uh, element in you that is your soul. So I, I think of it that way. And um, I feel very practiced because it happens to me a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, you're you're the big man. I mean, you've, you, you're like the wise elder. You got people coming to you all the time. And if you say, well, I don't know, or, hey, you know what? I've never thought of that before. <laughs> it will shock people, you know. <laughs> I suppose. That sounds like such a Hillman thing, though, that uh, inferiority is more associated with the soul. And I think maybe the opposite of that would be inflation would be this kind of spiritual uh, puffing up or, or elevation and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, inflation is wind, right? Flatus means wind. That's the, the what kind of wind? Flatus sounds familiar. <laughs> I know. It's the flatulence. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's great. The, in yeah. that, there's the deflating uh, a aspect of humor right in the word. It's great. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> right in that. And uh, most most uh, spiritual teachers don't see the connection between flatulence and the spiritual wind. <laughs> <laughs> Blowing their hot air. <laughs> hot air as well, yeah. So, uh, but it's, but that's there. And uh and I think that there is that feeling of the spirit of being superior, like I'm, I'm perfect. I'm striving for perfection, or I know th I I know things that you don't know. You know, I I'm uh, so I, I get that feeling from many spiritual people, and I, I don't mean the just traditional uh, people. You know, the traditional religions. I mean very contemporary spiritual people. Well, I think look at me often. I've seen the look on their faces for me and with just thinking uh, pity, you know, on me that I don't know what they know. <laughs> I just sit with it, you know, I, it's fine with me. I'm happy to be in that role. That's fine because I don't have aspirations to know everything or to have that uh, tight grip on the truth. Hmm. <clears throat> Reminds me, uh, um... Stephen Jenkinson, who's a Canadian writer, and uh, he doesn't call himself a teacher. He's a practitioner that you can go hang out with and maybe learn a few things from. Uh, but he would talk about, you know, walking into a room full of people after some big introduction about, you know, him being some kind of visionary or something like that. And he said he could see the disappointment on people's faces as he walked in and <laughs> he'd say, because he kind of looked like them, like he, you know. He didn't, uh, he says he didn't have the cafe au lait complexion that people expect from a guru or something. And, you know, he's kind of short of stature, so he's not tall enough. And, you know, you could just see the disappointment. And um, that reminds me of emptiness, though. Like, uh, I blurted out to my wife the other day. I don't know if I've heard this somewhere before, but um, we were talking about something and I just blurted out, uh, expectation breeds disappointment. And then I thought, well, that's kind of what I think what Tom's talking about in this book, you know, that uh, mm -hmm. if you if you can empty yourself of uh, expectation and you can go into situations uh, with like a kind of a fresh mind um, and, and avoid some of the suffering that a, a lot of those things that we fill ourselves with that they can bring. Yeah. Well, I, I would maybe counter that with expectation begs for emptiness. You know, it just wants to be emptied out because it's too full and it's too, if you don't empty it, then you're probably going to be disappointed, which is even more of a deflation mm -hmm. uh, as uh, it's going to happen to you. So it's better not to have your expectation. I, th I, think, he, I think it's probably not a good idea to say don't have any expectations. That's just part of life to mm -hmm. have some expectations, but, but they need to be empty. Mm -hmm. They could be emptied if you're going to practice emptiness. If, you, if let's say your friend hasn't didn't show up for your dinner and you're facing that empty plate across on the table from you, that would be a good time to reflect on emptying your expectations if you're not <laughs> thinking about something else. Yeah. And maybe uh, rethinking your, your friendship with that person, you know, if they just forgot about you or, you know, whatever. Um, I like uh, this this little um, 
I guess it's a haiku, although in the translation that you give, it's not in a, a real haiku form, but I think originally it's a haiku um, from, well, there's, it's two parts, real Ken, and it's a response that he wrote to poet Basho. And so I wanted to read the original and then Ryoken's response. And um, I've done my own translation based on something you mentioned in the commentary, because I think it just reads better. Yeah. So the, the original poem, Old Pond, Frog Jumps In, Plop. And then so the Ryoken's response is, New Pond, Frog Jumps In, Silence. <laughs> I just love that. I love that it's like a, a response to another poem and, and they really go, they go together. So I want to hear your, your thoughts on it. And I have my own thoughts about it. Well, I've, I've been thinking about that poem of Basho, as many people have for many years. It's a, it's a, it's a very old, you know, hundreds of years old, that poem of Basho. And, uh, and yet it's been a time around as one of the most important uh, uh, poems of that tradition. And you think, well, what's so important about that? You know, about a frog sits and uh, jumps. Sometimes the uh, translation is instead of plop, they, they translate splash. Or uh, sound of water. Sound of water, yeah. A lot of different possibilities there. Um, and I've I've always liked it because in its original form, because uh, I, one of the reasons I like the translation "splash" is that we can say that a lot of people say they want to make a splash, you know, they want to really. In other words, people do try to make a splash, but this frog is just doing it naturally, and uh, and that's what happens when he jumps in. There's a sound. There's a plop. Uh, and it's natural. That's what you would expect. That's what the beauty of it. So the frog jumps in, and there's nothing. Nothing happens, but you hear the the sound of his plopping. And uh, I think that's an interesting image for all of us. That uh, what whatever we do, uh, for example, for me, I don't know. It makes me think right now. So I've I've written all these books over these years. I wonder about it because I'm not sure that's a good way to spend your life writing books. But uh, anyway, I, that's just the way it's turned out for me, and I did it, so I can't undo it. So um, in a way, that's me, too. You know, for me, it's like, okay, so I, I write the books, and I go around talking to people. To me, it's, that's the plop. You write a book, and what it comes from is the plop. That's about it. But well, plop, plop has a different feeling than splash, right? Plop sounds kind of like, ooh, maybe it didn't make the big splash that I was hoping for, but it's just a kind of plop it, i like plop from that point of view yeah because it's it's it doesn't have that feeling of something really happened something big yeah uh so uh i but that's how i feel and i've thought about this that uh for me it's a plop it's not a it's not a big thing i should think about much i should just be there with the plop uh so i like that uh, on the other hand i also like the uh the revision of it to say no sound or uh, what did you say a silence um, yeah that's what yeah that's what you said you maybe would prefer that translation of silence um yeah yeah because um then it's uh there is no there's really no there, there's no there's no nothing happens you know then there's no big sound there's nothing no, silence is something really quite pure then. it's uh, And I like that too. So if I think of it for myself, uh, so if I keep writing books, I, I, I uh, and people always want to say something about it, but to me, there's nothing to be said. You know, it's like, I don't want to talk about it really. It's mm -hmm. just, you just, you do it. You do what you have to do. You do what you do. I never intended to write books. That was not my intention in my life ever. Uh, but it uh, came along and, uh, you know, plop. <laughs> well, you talk about um, how 
you know, you kind of imagine the second frog that doesn't make a sound going into the pond is uh, maybe a sleeker, or you could think, uh, you know, like an Olympic level diver. They have such good form that they just like kind of slide right into the water. Yeah, they just, they just slip into the water. So there's like a grace and an elegance in that. Uh, that I, don't, jump. I don't get that feeling from the poem, though. Do you? No, I kind of had a different read on it, actually. What jumped out at me in the two poems was the old pond and the new pond. Yeah. So old pond, frog jumps in, or splash. Right. New pond, frog jumps in, nothing, silence. Yeah. And so what jumped out at me was old pond, immediately the image of an old pond covered in like pond scum and lily pads and bulrushes, and then a new pond uh, being clear, empty, oh, I see. and that being the difference between making a sound and going in silently. Um, so for me, it was more about the pond and the buildup, uh, you know, thinking about my mind and, and buildup of old ideas and conceptions and things. Um, we have a lot of plopping, plopping around, uh, but if it's clear, maybe things co come in easier, you know, less resistance. Uh -huh. uh, so to new ideas or freshness. So you're preferring the uh, the new pond then? Uh, I don't know if it's preference. But I think maybe that's what the poem is saying to me. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Like the yeah. frog maybe is like a new idea trying to jump in or something. Uh, and if my head is all full of old stuff, uh, it won't go in as easily. Yeah, I think it's worth uh, really uh, what you're doing is uh, is amplifying or uh, not. That's not a good word because that's in Jung, but some kind of uh, elaboration of that image of these images and trying to see more. I think that's very valuable to think about what an old pond is compared to a new pond, the difference between a plop and a splash and a silence, and, uh, and why is it a frog that we're talking about anyway? about a frog mm -hmm. jump on. And there are a lot of, it raises a lot of references. I think about the beautiful, uh, that's the fairy tale of the frog prince that uh, Joseph Campbell wrote about so beautifully, I thought. Um, so I bring a lot, I have a lot of associations with the with this poem. And uh, so I think sometimes that a little bit like you, I feel that the old pond has a lot of associations and the new pond might be fresh and, and uh, not, not so surrounded by all those things. And maybe there'd be some silence. So uh, yeah, I, I think it's worth that conversation. And uh, you could talk about this. We could talk about it again next week and we'd have different thoughts about it. Yeah, and, uh, well, that's kind of the beauty of the simplicity of the poems, <clears throat> like the emptiness of the poem uh, allows you to kind of fill in the gaps with uh, things that you bring from your experience, right? Exactly. That's a nice way to put it. The poem itself is empty. And it, those, and it teaches us then the lesson that emptiness can be fruitful. It's not, it's not void. It's not a vacancy. It's not an absolute literal void. It's just the opposite. The emptiness can inspire all kinds of things, all kinds of activities or thoughts or who knows what. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's wonderful because, like, that's another reason why I find those those little uh, haikus so refreshing. Um, sometimes, you know, I think it's one of those things. Like, I think I should read poetry and appreciate it, right? Like, you're supposed to if you're a cultured person or a soulful person. Uh, but so much of poetry, I can't get into, and maybe one of the reasons why I can't get into it is because there's not enough space for me to enter it. It's it's full of words and images and clever wordplay and things. And I can be kind of dazzled maybe by the, the poet's uh, ability with language. Uh, but something like that, <clears throat> immediately I get an image and it's, it's, it's an image from my unconscious. I don't know if the pond that I'm visualizing is the same as the one that Basho's visualizing it's probably not or even the frog is it a little fat frog is it a sleek green frog is it like a wordy frog mm -hmm. um so there's like yeah there's this uh 
this emptiness that that draws me into it and creates like a world that I can enter. And it's like what ten words. It's amazing. Yeah, I think that's right. We're there's something important here. I think significant anyway. That um, a, a poet like Basho, and there are some modern poets like him. Uh, their idea is to carve out a hole, some space around all the fullness of life. There's so much fullness of life these days that um, uh, we, we could use something that uh, doesn't give us everything. It just is like a skeleton that, or maybe just an insinuation, you know, rather than anything elaborate. Mm. And that allows us then to have an imagination. If the poet gives us everything, gives us all kinds of detail and and wants to tell us how to feel about things, uh, then there's no emptiness. There's no opportunity for this other thing, which is very creative. Yeah, there's no room for us, uh, what we bring to it. Um, I, was, I was talking about this with a friend uh, just the other day, how so many people that I'm meeting in my practice, especially, but in just generally in life, uh, so many people have a lot of anxiety right now about so many different things, you know, what's going on in the world, what's going on in their life. And what I find uh, just with a little kind of digging, a little bit of inquiry is that um, so many people right now are completely overwhelmed. And they use the word overwhelmed, but I just think of it, they're just so full. Uh, they're so full of you know, the news that they're taking in, all of the images that they're taking in through the social media and, you know, advertisements everywhere. Uh, they're reading self-help books. They're trying to sort, but they're just filling themselves up with all of this stuff, all of this information and images. And uh, I think that's what leads to the feeling of overwhelm is just too much fullness. And so I'm always recommending to people to try to make some space for just emptying out not doing, uh, give yourself some space. Uh, and then you might find that, you know, I think about it as like emptying out the mind so that something from the soul or the heart can come forward and then give you some, some guidance or inspiration. Uh, but if you're just looking to fill yourself up with solutions or more information, that's kind of causing the problem that you're then trying to get rid of, you know? Yes. This is this is really getting close to my motivation for putting this book together. I say putting it together because it's not exactly written. You know, I do write comments, but it, putting this thing together because I do feel that in this world today we do need uh, we we do need that emptiness of whatever form it takes. It can be very to use the word you've been using refreshing refresh uh, your your emotions and your thoughts and i was reading in the henry david thoreau last night that uh, he was talking about uh, putting a border around your life that is empty a border where mm. nothing is happening have a good border where you're not doing anything and he gives an example how he he uh, he said that he got up in the morning and had his bath and had some breakfast and he sat in his chair and and he didn't realize that what was going on until late in the afternoon he was still sitting in his chair and still looking at things around him and then he thought well that's a good day hmm. you know i mean that's not the way he spent every day but that was a good day because it had more of a border than usual more emptiness than usual so it doesn't have to there are no rules about how to do this but I think we could all practice emptiness in a sense that find our own way to bring some nothingness, some something where we're not doing anything or we're not uh, we're not trying to accomplish anything. I remember one time this reminds me, my family who are pretty educated in all these things, my daughter and my wife and my stepson. And uh, so they they were all talking about their names. My wife and daughter both had spiritual names that were given to them and they really liked them. And, and uh, my, my stepson has his own spiritual name and they said, what's yours? You know, and and uh, I said, well, my name is Wu Wei. And uh, <laughs> that means essentially not doing anything. <laughs> Accomplishing something, but not doing anything, Wu Wei, as I understand it. So mm -hmm. I, I like to be called Wu Wei, you know, the guy who doesn't do anything, but still accomplishes something, even though he's not doing anything. And yeah. 
I think you can have that feeling in your daily life. Like for me, I people say to me, I'm writing all the, I've written what, 32 books now. They say, you must really be disciplined to do all that. And I think that that's a weird sound to me because I would never call myself disciplined. <laughs> I've never felt disciplined in my life. Um, and I don't feel disciplined writing these books. I feel great joy with them. And if I have if I have a moment to give to writing my book, uh, I feel like that's stolen from all the busyness around me and all the things that people want me to do and expect me to do. Mm. So to me, it's a great emptiness to, to be able to uh, to do that work. That's great. Fantastic. Well, Tom, thanks so much for chatting with me. Um, I know you're about to go on a trip with some friends from the Soul Psychology course over to Fair Ireland. Yes. Um, I'm a little jealous just that you get to be surrounded by the language and that accent. Uh, it's beautiful. It's, uh, oh, it's, it's music to my ears. It's like food for my soul hearing people speak with that well, Irish there, tongue. There are many different Irish accents. I used to know them by county. If I heard someone speak, I knew what county they were from. There was this, there are so many, but uh, some of them are unintelligible to me, and mm. uh, they're not the sweet lyrical ones. And, uh, <laughs> and there are others that are pretty rough. But uh, generally, I think the uh, there's a musicality in the way people in Ireland uh, speak, and it's uh, it, it's something you get used to. And uh, when you leave it, it's you, you feel the loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you come here to North America, and there's something um, the the uh, the dialects or the accents kind of clang around a little too harshly for my taste. Uh, unless I go very far east in Canada, and you pick up some of that Scottish Scottish Irish uh, yeah. flavor. Well, yeah, thanks for making the time to speak with us. Um, the new book is out in in May, right on New World Press. Yes. May, May 23rd. Great. And are you going to continue with your soul psychology course? I don't know. I don't There's know. There's the emptiness. <laughs> <laughs> well, your accountant and your agent are like, come on. Tom. <laughs> no, I don't know. I will see as the time goes. You know, I don't know if it's, a, I don't, I really don't know. But I'm enjoying it very much. I like uh, I I like it for. Can I talk about it for a minute? Yeah, it, sure. I like um, I like being able to finally teach in a way I've always wanted to. I've always had to teach for universities or some organization, and they all had their rules and requirements, and and therefore uh, I've been fired from places. You know, I I was denied tenure at a university because of the way I I taught. At least I think that's why they fired me, and uh, and other places too were not happy because I didn't. So now I can teach online the way I want, and I find and I I do uh, practice emptiness with it. I really do, in many different ways, and I think it helps. I think that people coming there have a lot of room to learn things. It's a lot of space to mm -hmm. learn, things. and. Uh, I'm not, I hope I'm not dominating it. I try to insert myself in, in places in a way that's not, uh, that doesn't destroy the, the empty space of learning. So it's a great challenge, but it's also a great deal of fun for me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I will be able to continue. I love doing it, but it all depends. I, there's still, the, the interest is still there. A lot of people are interested in it. So that's an important factor. I can't teach if no one shows up. Yeah. Well, I know you talked about maybe figuring out a way to uh, do it more as a self-directed course as well for people. Um, yes. I think that would work well, but I, I think, you know, just personally, one of the things I got uh, out of the course the most was the dialogue with other people going through the course and exchanging ideas about some of the things that you you post. So even if some of your lectures were pre-recorded to have a, a live forum with the oh, yeah. with the cohort or students would be, I think, really important. Oh, that's an interesting thought. You mean like if 
if the if my talks were recorded, would would I be involved in the discussions? Then is that what you're saying? Uh, well, you could, but I think maybe that would just open up your schedule a bit more because you wouldn't have to get on live and, and do yeah. the lecture, but it would still have a live component uh, always. So I'm not just isolated in my house going through the course on my own. Then I would right. miss that interchange. Well, that's a nice idea. Yeah, we'll have to talk to you about that more. Brian. Well, you can consult me on it. Sure. When you get well, back from okay. Ireland, we can talk. Yeah, okay. If, if, see if I picked up any of the Irish musicality while I'm there. Yeah. Well, what are you going to be doing over there? I'm curious about that. You don't you normally lead retreats and things like that, but you're no, taking no, no. some. I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a leader of retreats uh, elsewhere. I don't take people to other places. No, I don't do that. I have, I've done a lot of workshops over the years, many, many, uh, all over the United States and Canada. But I'm not going to be... Uh, I, I don't I don't do that very much. I don't take people to see places. I, I don't I couldn't imagine myself doing that actually. It's not who I am. <laughs> Your poor runs screaming from any kind of, you know, I gotta take care of these people for a week. Yeah. Oh, forget I couldn't, it. I couldn't do that at all. Stick to an itinerary? No way. No space. No, I couldn't do that. Um but Me neither. Uh, <laughs> But in this case, in, in Ireland, I think what we're doing, our main purpose is, my main purpose, as I see it anyway, is to have people come together. They've been they've been joined on Zoom or, or Ruzuku or some other, you know, means, electronic means, and they like to meet in person. And Ireland seems to be a good place to do that. And on a neutral ground, I think, makes a lot of sense. And, but to me, the whole thing is I'm I'm hoping to play a game of golf if I can find people who will tolerate me. And um, the last time I took people, I played with golf with a group of uh, people from various countries there in Ireland. They didn't tolerate me well at all. <laughs> I was so bad, they were really astonished. So, um, but I'd like to do that. I'd like to play a bad round of golf and, uh, and uh, I'd like to, uh, listen to some Irish music. We're going to have some uh, some music. We were hoping my daughter would uh, would sing. She, she lives in Ireland and mm. she uh, she knows uh, enough Irish, the Irish language enough to, to sing the tradi some traditional songs. But she's uh, not, not doing well physically right now, so I don't mm. think she'll be uh, available for us. But um, I think we'll have a great time and uh, just being there, you know, what the, the Irish call it, crack, have a good crack. And yeah. And uh, I think that's the main thing. And I know mm -hmm. that people are interested in me talking to them about dreams and, and maybe uh, discussing dreams together, some dreams every morning. Nice. Yeah. And I've done that before, and that's very, uh, that can be very uh, educational at the same time uh, relaxing so I, i'm looking forward to do some of that but no no formal teaching really yeah no, that sounds nice well enjoy yourself and uh safe travels tom we'll see you down the road i hope you enjoy yourself too and brian i want to thank you for uh focusing on this book of mine and talking with me about it and giving me some good ideas a lot in, in our conversation um, it's I, I appreciate so much the work you do and your understanding of these things. It's very rare. So it's a great pleasure for me to be with you today. Well, that's so nice to hear. And, you know, I just love all of your work. And, uh, you know, I've joked with you about, about this before, but um, I think you're a hard teacher for a lot of modern folks who are, you know, thinking about self-help or self-development or healing um just be like i've joked about it saying like reductionism sells and you're not a reductionist kind of guy and you do like to leave a lot of space for to draw you know for something to emerge from the person that's i think the real meaning of education is the teacher allows something to come forth in the student not always stuffing them full of <laughs> their own stuff right um, and that's that's kind of like counter to the whole capitalist paradigm that uh, is infiltrated even the the healing and self development worlds. And you 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 subvert that at every step, and um, you you never take on the role of guru or, or teacher. 
uh, and th th that's kind of hard for people to grasp. So I just want to keep promoting your work. And I think, like, for me, it's an inspiration uh, if I continue to do any kind of um, therapy work or teaching work. Uh, th that's the way I want to do it, is, is what I see you doing. Uh, I think that's the healthiest person for the, the healthiest, healthiest approach or the way for the people you're trying to help, actually, <laughs> you know? Well, well, Brian, I think that you are well on the way, if, if not there, of uh, of doing that in your own way. You have your own style and your own knowledge of certain things and tradition, all that uh, supporting you in your own way. And I hope that you do find a, a form that is really satisfying to you. I'm sure you're, I feel like you're just, you know, you're just touching it now and ready mm -hmm. to share. Yeah. Well, thanks, Tom. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye.